Before I jump into my guest today, I have a request. This whole podcast process, and it's a process, not just the guests that you listen to, not just my monologues, but the process of attracting better and better guests. You can help me. How? First off, email me recommendations. Top flight minds, good talkers, send me your ideas. Number two, and everyone can do this, and it truly will help my podcast get more recognition, more listeners, which will make it much easier to get good guests. Not that I've not had good guests already. I have. But I want continued good guests. What can you do? Go to iTunes and write a review. No excuses. Get off your butt. Write that review. Now for my guest. This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. Today on the podcast, I have David Ryan. David was famously first featured in the Market Wizards book by Jack Schwager. He's also a protege of William O'Neill. That's where he got his start. In fact, how he got his start is inspiration. Just do it. I hope you enjoy this conversation. So here's what I want, I want to start with, and, and I want you to go back in time with me, is that a lot of people hear these kinds of stories and they say, oh, really, that's not how it worked or whatever. But you essentially got in the door by knocking on the door and essentially saying, I'll do anything. I'll work for free. Am, am I going the right direction? I mean, this is how you initially got started. Yeah, I see. I... Uh, when I, the way I really got started is, I mean, my interest is, uh, I had a, uh, my dad, uh, he would, he would, uh, he was in real estate, but he would actually buy stocks for a, you know, college fund and he would discuss them at dinner and talk about how he'd, you know, and this was in the mid early, mid to later sixties where he would say, oh, you know, I just bought some, uh, did some stock in this, uh, New franchise of chicken called Kentucky Fried Chicken, and or he bought some stock in Disney and and, and things like that. And so my brothers, my brother and I got interested in the market, and I actually had a, a trial subscription to Daily Graphs, which was the precursor to Market Smith from William O'Neill and Company. And I actually, you know, started looking at the market and. Had a subscription to Value Line and things like that, so I was, I was very, very interested. I bought my first stock when I was thirteen in a in a candy company, just ten shares of a kind of stock that that um, made bit of honey and chunky candy bars. So I had this ongoing interest, and I even I even went to you know O'Neill would give some free lectures every once or or you know sort of free seminars in the uh you know on the west side of Los Angeles every once in a while and um, I I think my mom or my dad took me to to that and so I watched and I listened and and when I got out of the college when I graduated from UCLA I had a job on the on the Pacific Coast Stock Exchange at that time and and after working as a runner there for a while for just a couple of months I said you know why don't I just walk up why don't I just try at O'Neill and Company to get a uh, to, to see if they have something available there, and so I just I basically just walked up the front stairs of the company uh, and went to the receptionist and and said, "Hey, is there anyone here I can talk to about part time job, internship, anything? I'll work I'll work for free. I just want to learn how William O'Neill's made so much money in the market." And sat down with his assistant. Uh, for for about a half an hour and told her some of the books I had read and and how I was interested and and even before I got home that day there was an there was a um, 
a message saying that uh, uh, to call Kathy Sherman because she wants to set up an appointment with you with uh, William O'Neill tomorrow to uh, to interview. And I had never been on an interview in my life. I don't even remember what I wore. And I don't even think I went in a jacket and tie, but I went in and all I just kept on saying is I just want to learn. I've heard you've done well in the market. I've just got a fascination with the market. And so I started part time, got my foot in the door, was just in, you know, just, just really loved it, able to ask questions, study past recommendations. And, uh, and then that worked into full time and I ended up sent, spending, uh, almost 17 years at the company. Let me, let me circle back for one second. So, you're a young man, you know, at this moment in time, you know, this is, it might be your first interview, but you, you know, this is seriously important. Uh, you know, I was, I think I was so naive. I, you know, I've got, yeah, I've got a very strong Christian faith. And I think that things don't happen, you know, without reason. And I just almost feel God was directing me to this company, to this, to, to this, uh, to this occupation, I just, I, it was an inborn interest I had in the market. I just became fascinated with the market, and I just, I think I was just very naive. I didn't know how important and or how well it would have worked out, but it just, it's amazing how the pieces just came together. The fact that William O'Neill and Company. His offices were on the west side of Los Angeles, which was 15 minutes from where I grew up. He actually lived almost around the corner from me. And so there's just so, so many coincidences where I, I just can't say, oh, that just happened by chance. <laughs> was, but I would almost say I just almost didn't know. I was I was almost too naive or, or not, just not smart enough to, to know exactly what I was doing. I just... Yeah. Serendipity sometimes just happens. Hey, uh, one more question about that, though. Was there anything during that initial conversation with him that you recall that struck you or you're like, okay, I'm now having this meeting with this very successful investor. Did he say anything during that first conversation where it just struck you like, oh, wow, that that just that, that lit you up in a way? It was, or you just don't really recall? No, I, 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 some of the questions, I just, one of the questions I remembered, I mean, he was asking questions, well, what are your goals in five years? Do you want to go to a, uh, do you, do you want to get an MBA? Do you want to go to a business school? And, and I, you know, again, I had never answered, uh, really didn't know. I just said, I have got a, a real big interest in the, in the stock market. And I'm fascinated. I want to see why some stocks go up and make great runs and others go down and, and I, I just want to learn. And that's all I, and I, and I also said, I, I, you don't have to pay me because I've been in school since I was, you know, five years old and now I'm, you know, 20 some odd and, uh, my parents wouldn't mind if I lived at home and, and, uh, you know, for another year and, and didn't pay rent. And so I went at it that angle. So that's, that's really what I remember from that, from that interview. Let me, let me ask, let me bring things up to current day. You've been running your own private hedge fund for many years now. And how would you best describe, given that early background and training, but how would you describe your approach, your style of trading today? Okay. uh, Just one correction. I actually ran, I, I had a hedge fund open from 98 up until last year. Now I'm just running my own money. Um, but I was, I had the hedge fund for 15 years. I was at O'Neill and Company for almost, yeah, again, almost 17 years. But my, my approach, very, you know, very William O'Neill, uh, can slim type of approach where I'm looking for growth stocks. I'm looking for stocks with the greatest characteristics, with the characteristics of the greatest winners of all time. And I, I continue to do that. Um, you know, maybe I've gotten as I've gotten older and and a number of responsibilities in terms of home and family and, and such that maybe I've gotten more conservative in my in my approach, but I'm still looking for those those types of uh, characteristics found in the greatest winning stocks. So in my world, I've I've put five books out about quantitative trend following. Which is a, is a kissing cousin, I would think, to Ken Slim in many ways. But why don't you talk about the idea for the audience out there that maybe is not familiar with Ken Slim? Why don't you talk about the idea of buying the breakout versus buying the dip and the thought process there? Because 
I, I'm assuming, and I'm not a Ken Slim expert by any expert by any stretch of the imagination, but finding those good growth stocks, there's a lot of uh, that's a lot of a breakout mentality, and it's buying strength is part of that process. Is that correct? Uh, yes, it's you know part of the sort of the the Can Slim, which is the Can Slim, which is an acronym for the different characteristics you look for. Is one of them is N for for new highs in price, and that's the the thinking there is that any stock that makes a huge move that makes you know stock that makes a run from twenty five to one hundred and twenty five has to be making a new high on the way you know every every penny on the way up. And so, and the, the the thing about when you're buying at new highs is that you have no overhead supply. There's no one ahead of you, no one at higher prices who have bought, who are looking to sell. So, anybody who owns that stock when it when it gets into new high ground has a has a profit, and uh, the only people that are selling are people that are taking profit. So there's no yeah again no overhead supply. So that's that's one of the characteristics that. That were found in in stocks that made that made some of the greatest moves. But you just don't buy a stock just because it's making a new high. You have to look for a stock that's been basing for a number of weeks, and then you have to have then the stock has to have all the other characteristics found in the greatest winning stocks. You know, before I ask this next next question, I want to circle back to as you were describing the ending of your money management firm. There's got to be a side of you that also enjoys the fact that you don't have clients now. Oh, it's, uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I had really some of the greatest clients. I mean, I had probably, you know, close to 70 clients and a lot of them just said, Hey, look, I'm running my business. I'll call you in 10 years. And very, very few calls ever. Uh, the only time I knew when the market was getting close to a, a bottom is when I would get a two or three calls in a day. But a, a lot of clients I would you know, I would rarely talk to in, in, during the year, and uh, but all all very nice and didn't really. I, the, the only pressure that they that I really felt was really more self imposed and and you know kind of a, a level of performance that I thought I should have. But I still uh, the greatest thing now is that I can still enjoy the market. Still look for those greatest winners, but not have that feeling like I always have to, I always have to get uh, the performance. If I don't like the market or what I like or what what I'm seeing, I can just sell out and step away for for weeks. Uh, so it's it's a lot more relaxing, but it, it's still a lot of fun to uh, to do. You know, I want to talk about big picture in a second. The, the perhaps changing environment that some traders may describe since 2008. But before I bring that up, I, I want to maybe let you paint a picture of some, some stocks from your perspective that have fit your model that have really taken off. What, what have been some good can slim winners in the last two or three years from your perspective? Some of the, some of the better winners have been, Stocks like uh, you know Chipotle, Mexican food, food symbol CMG, uh, Priceline is another one. You know, Apple maybe not not recently in the last last year and a half or so, but that was just really you know a great great model of a of a stock to to look for. And and I would always I I always like to when when people ask me you know, well where do you get your ideas and I always found that the best ideas I I can I can find are usually the ones where I'm actually buying the product using the product shopping at the store or using that service because you can have a lot better feel for what they're doing if you're if you're able to touch and feel the the product itself so so those are some of the some of the some of the examples. Some sometimes when you get into something that's very high tech or or even a biotech that that can be hard to understand for the the layman, then uh, those are those are harder stocks to to really stay on to for the uh, for the longer term move. You know, you mentioned Priceline, and I I've always been a fan of Star Trek, and uh, but William Shatner uh, he really picked the lottery ticket with Priceline. Um, oh yeah, 
He, he did. He did fabulous with that. Probably, probably one of the best investments any actor in, in LA has, has, has ever made. Probably, uh, fantastic. Um, exactly. Yeah. Hey, listen, so big picture wise, what's your max loss that you're willing to take on a position? You initiate a new position, first time you're in it. What's your max loss you're willing to take? You know, I, I really cut my losses short. I mean, I usually don't let them even go beyond probably five, five uh, percent, and and a lot of them even less than that. And I, it, and and if I have maybe one, if there's something that I have to keep on working on, is actually giving a stock a little bit more room because that's cutting it very very close. Lots of times, I've always said that the best stocks I own are the ones that I've timed them so well. I've, I've, I've gotten the buy point down to such a, an, an exact spot that when I buy a stock, in most cases, by the end of the day, that stock should be higher. And I usually cannot live with a stock or live with a loss for, you know, for much, for, for too long. I mean, even days I start getting, a little, a little nervous that, you know, maybe my, you know, the, the stock, I, the timing wasn't right or that I didn't buy the right stock. And so the best stocks for me are always the ones where the timing is, I'm, I'm buying it right, coming right out of a proper base and the stock starts taking off and go and, and, and goes. You know, in the, in the, in the arena of novice investing or perhaps people that come to the investing world for the first time, it's, pretty well known that, that folks think that a high accuracy, you know, oh, my, my entry signals are 95% accurate. Um, that, that seems to be when people first come to the markets, they, they think this is a natural way to be that perfection. But the reality is in your world, what type of winning percentage do you really see? Oh, I, you know, in, in, if I can, if I can pick 50% winners, I think I'm doing a good job. I mean, if I get into the 60s, that that's fantastic, uh, because it, a lot of those a lot of those stocks that I take the losses on are very very small losses. But then, if I can get, and if and, and, and an investor can get, you know, one, two, or even three really good stocks in a year, they can have a fantastic year if they just keep those losses small. I think what people get into is they start defending a position that they've got a loss in they start making excuses they can they can infinitely rationalize why they should continue to hold on to the stock but the key is that got to keep their losses small because you just don't want it to get to get bigger i mean a stock goes down by a third and you just and you know, i think the Mathematics, you have to make, you have to come back 50%, or, or if a stock goes down 50%, you have to double your money. Hmm. So that's why I keep them very, very small. The loss is very small. And then, and then sooner or later, I'm just going to time a stock right. I'm going to get the right, uh, uh, the right seam and the, and, and the right industry. And, and the stock's going to make a great move. And if I handle it well and keep and add to, uh, add to a position that's working out, then uh, that's where that's where you can really make some some very very good money. Let me let me add to the risk management questions. You take your account, and I'm assuming this advice would apply to other people out there. You're saying, hey, put put ten percent into the markets and put the other ninety percent in cash. Be, be willing to lose that ten percent. Don't lose your whole bankroll, but be willing to lose that ten percent. But put the other aside. You mean uh, in terms of uh, managing a, a, a whole account? Well, the, the, the way I, I usually think about it, when I'm starting a position, I'm starting with about a, a five percent position, and within a within even a day or a, a couple of days, I might if that the stock starts working out, I might move that up to a ten percent position, and that's that's there. Maybe I get a little bit bigger, but usually I, I take my account and I tend I. Divided into ten pieces, and as some of the stocks start working out well, then they start becoming heavier and bigger positions. If a stock makes a nice move from, let's say, twenty-five to thirty-five, builds a whole new base and starts moving again, that that stock might be a a twenty percent position or even a twenty-five percent position if it's if it's been performing well. But it only gets to that that large of a size of the portfolio after it's already made some money for me and I've already got a cushion. 
Um, but on yeah, on initial positions, maybe it's a, it's usually a five percent position. If it stops, if it doesn't work out, uh, I'm out of it very very quickly, and I move on to the next name, or I just continue to watch that stock. Maybe it sets up again, and maybe I go back and and, and buy it again. Let me let me shift gears again on you, and what I want to talk about is. Everything that we've seen, and I've talked to quite a few investors, traders over the last six months of my podcast, and and to a man, to a woman, you can kind of tell that, yes, people have their systems, yes, people have their approaches, but there's an uneasiness about the overall uh, market system since, let's say, 08. And I think I always say to myself, I was like, well, you know, when 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 the government starts to bail out banks and save some companies and not save other companies. And then when you have significant uh, Fed uh, action in the markets, and maybe even action that we don't even know about, it, there's some distortions. Now, that's not an excuse, and I'm, I'm not a, a fundamental guy per se, but it, it is a reality that there's been things that have uh, taken place in the last five or six years that are unique, maybe, in, in the history of American markets. How do you look at the last since 08? How, how does it make you feel when you look at the whole situation that's unfolded? You know, I, I don't, I don't like seeing government involved in the markets. I, I, I think they should, the market should take care of themselves in terms of, in, in terms of them getting in and bailing out companies. Uh, it's just, it, it, there should be an, uh, I, I think one of the best things that happens in the U.S. economy is it, it's companies can fail. They can go bankrupt. And, and I think you just, you cause all sorts of distortions when you start propping up entities that, that maybe shouldn't, shouldn't have existed. With that said, some of the changes I've seen or some of the, the way the markets have been moving since 2008 in terms of, uh, in terms of the high frequency trading, is something that I don't like and looking into it, it looks, it looks very illegal in terms of front ran, uh, front running. And I think that when there's an illegal practice going on on the market, and I think that should be addressed and that should be eliminated because I, I, I've just seen moves in stocks and the speed that stocks move have been, have been a lot bigger than they have in the past since Really, since probably 2000, uh, 2008. With that said, though, the, the stocks that have these, the characteristics of the greatest winners really does not change. They still have these canceling characteristics, but they do take a lot, the, the, the volatility of some of these moves are a lot bigger. And it's, it's been very, very hard to get, uh, used to some of these the volatility in some of these stocks. It's interesting times for sure. And uh, I think maybe deep down in our gut, we all know that at some point in time, something unexpected and surprising will happen. I, I, I don't know if I, given that I've seen twice in the last 15 years uh, uh, that when Fed has dropped the, the interest rates so low and we've seen big moves and and then something happens. I, I don't know what will happen or when it will happen, but I, I think something will happen at some point in time. <laughs> Yeah, I, you know, I, every time I read that they, I saw it just even the last couple of weeks thinking, you know, some people saying there's just going to be a, a, a big hit down on the market. I say, you know, when everybody seems to be talking about it, I, I kind of tend to say, you know, it's probably not going to happen. But again, with that being said, even when I was in the market in 87, when we had that crash in 87, and then we had some, some dramatic drops in, you know, in two, Starting in March of 2000, and then starting in in 2008, that it usually doesn't hit a high, and the next day it goes straight down. Usually, it takes a few weeks, if not a number of months, for a top to form, and then the whole market to to roll over. So I I don't expect it to come out of just out of nowhere. As long as this, you know, you've got individual stocks that are acting well, and you've got markets that are hitting highs, that you usually get some warning. Now, maybe this time it'll be very quick, but but you know if we do get that large correction, you're going to start seeing it show up in the individual stocks and and in the averages. You know, I have one last question for you, and I can hear it in your voice. I hear it in your personality. But the market is humbling, isn't it? 
Oh, yes. I've always said that the stock market is one, and any markets are is the the most humbling mechanism in 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 the world because anytime you think, oh yeah, I've got this down, I've got it, I I can't miss the the market's my own little my own little pot of gold. That's right, right when you you get your head handed to you. I think the greatest thing, the the best thing someone can have is an attitude when they walk in is is that you have to take your ego, you got to throw it into the trash can, and you have to say that 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 you you have to have a di- discipline, no matter what approach it is. It could be growth stocks, it could be value, it could be day trading. You have to have a discipline to get the emotion out of the market, get your ego out of the market, and you should almost be acting robotic, uh, robotic-like where you see the information, your discipline tells you what to do, and you act on it. Anytime the emotions come in, the ego comes in, you now greed, fear, and the whole thing comes in, that's when you start doing very, very poorly in the market. I think it's uh, sound advice. I know we've, everyone can pick up uh, untold number of books and they can pick up one of the books that you are famously profiled in the market wizards book and we can all read the words but i think it's sometimes nice to hear people say it and and just it's a reminder and it's uh it's very true hey um david you i know you've got a a seminar in the fall um with mark minervini do you have the details of that or is there a place that people can go to find out more information just uh, Google uh, Mark Minervini private access. Mark's got a website which uh, you can go to, and there'll there'll be details on that website where it's a it's a two day, well almost three days. We start with a, a meet and greet on Friday night that go uh, Saturday and Sunday, and this is October in Myrtle Beach uh, of this year, late this year. It's a great two day seminar, and you know Mark is extremely detailed. It's got a huge workbook that we go through, and uh, and I'm 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 up there with him, pointing out things, adding to the discussion of of what to look for in stocks that have uh, you know that have these characteristics that I've been uh, talking about. But it, it's a it's a great workshop. I did it last year with him. Great people and some some very good discussion. And he's constantly making it better and adding new sections to the um, to the workshop. So I'm I'm looking forward to doing it with him, and it should be uh, it should be great uh, interacting with the the people that attend. David, I appreciate you taking the time today, and it was fun chatting. And hopefully, we can talk again in the future. Okay, that'd be great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Take care. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.